Monday, everybody. Welcome back to the Couchside Judges. I'm Scott Fontana. Follow me on Twitter at Scott underscore Fontana. And I'm Dan Urban. Follow me at the Dan Urban. Follow the podcast at Couchside Judges. Subscribe to us on YouTube, on Spotify, Apple, somewhere else. Not Stitcher. Stitcher's gone. And yeah, well, we're, yeah, we were on there. We were. Yeah. Maybe read the criteria though. Oh, you weren't you weren't gonna ask for a five star review? No, no, we don't do that anymore. Oh, okay. Well, make sure you read the criteria because we talk MMA judging. Yeah, we, we're, I'm done begging for reviews that no one oh, ever okay. gave us. We gave you chances, guys. You were giving us the five star review. You'd have done it by now. We would still appreciate it, though. Oh yeah, we would. That's true. <laughs> I'm sitting there scolding people. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Everyone should know that when you come here, you're gonna be held accountable. Yeah. Even the listeners. <laughs> Oh, man. What's wild, though, sir? Did you see the number in front of this episode? Yeah. 250. 250 shows, 250 times we've done this. It's gotten got a little more. Yeah. We, we, we rounded into into form like a long while ago. Yeah. Remember in, yeah. in the early days and we have to record the, the intro like a good like 10 times because we kept screwing well, it up. We just wrote a script. and Well, that's true. Couldn't write. I couldn't read. Yeah. No. So. Reading is hard. Yeah. Reading is hard. Honestly, I, I, look, I write for a living, and I'll tell you, uh, I'm not very good. <laughs> 250 shows, though. Did you think we were going to get here? Uh, I don't know if I, if I had any expectations, hmm. to be honest. I mean, I thought it was dead in the water. One test episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah. Anything kind of beyond, beyond that is uh, we're playing with house money. I suppose that is so. true. <laughs> <laughs> But but yeah, so here we are talking about UFC London, two hundred fifty shows it's, in. It's weird that we don't count the numbers for anything outside Vegas. Like oh this oh, be, this would be like London four or something. Yeah yeah yeah, I know. I, well, it's really more than that, but but yeah. Well, and actually, we don't count the Vegas shows that take place outside of UFC Apex for the number. Remember they went to yeah, the, the just, smaller. I can't remember what venue it was. USV Las Vegas. Yeah, UFC <laughs> Las Vegas as opposed to UFC Vegas number. <laughs> Weird. So I liked when remember we used to number them as it, it was UFC Apex yeah. number. I thought that was the way to go. Yeah, why wouldn't you go that way? You know why? Because I don't. I, I I don't actually know why. I was hoping you did. Why we st- didn't do that? My no. Why they didn't. Why UFC didn't do that? UFC Apex number one. UFC Apex number two. I don't know two. why. I don't know why. UFC they didn't Apex do that. number six thousand four hundred forty-four. I don't know. Maybe they didn't want. I don't know. Maybe there was a stigma to the Apex, or they, they thought they, there possibly would be one in the future. I think they've gotten over it. Well, yeah, for sure they've gotten <laughs> over it. I don't know. I mean, if anything, I thought it was probably more of like a, a niche kind of neat thing in the beginning that now people very quickly have gotten tired of. Because now they've seen that the quality of the shows dips dramatically when they oh they don't stay care. at the apex oh yeah, yeah it's true it's care. pure television at that point they don't care. it's kind of wild because we we had Nganu for Stipe in the apex we did we had Stipe versus DC in the apex mm-hmm. some big fights of course they had no choice at that point because they they were like heck or high water we're gonna put on shows so mm. um pay per views are gonna be here who cares yeah I guess mercifully they've taken that on the road <laughs> but uh but yeah I mean obviously we're in London for this one and and. I know you weren't a big fan of the matchup for the the headliner here with Tom Aspinall, but the, the result that I think probably you expected anyway still came. Oh yeah, the result, and he looked great. The expected result was there. Tom Aspinall looked; he did what he was supposed to do. He looked great doing it. Uh, it's the thing is, he was expected to do that, and he did that. Yeah, so. but but also he is a heavyweight, sir. Yeah, and he finished the fight in half a round the way he's supposed to. He did the job. Yeah, that's important. We had another heavyweight fight earlier on the card. Now, granted, this is the fight that I had called out as the one we were going to definitely be talking about for contestant rounds. And I think that um, jinxed it in a good way for us because now we don't have to talk about. Thank Mick, God. Uh, I, I don't, honestly, the names even escape me. Jamal Pogues lost. Who's who's he? Who is it beat him? Mick Packlin? Mick Parkin. Parkin. Thank you. Um, yeah. Glad we don't have to talk about that one. Uh, I skipped that fight. I didn't watch that at all because I was. At you a don't playground. need to. I was at a playground with my kid. So I missed a lot of these fights. I kind of went back to watch the rounds we needed to, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm glad I'll never watch that in my life. It sounds just, sounds, just, sounds like I missed nothing. You missed absolutely a fight that at least one fighter is going to regret. Be like, wow. Well, yeah, the one who didn't so, get the you know the, the, yeah, the think, win bonus probably will regret he, that. I think he landed like twelve strikes. Oh, super! It was one of those fights. It was hard. It was a sparring round, sparring mm-hmm. match. It was terrible. All right. 
Fair enough. Back to Aspinall, though, because obviously you and I both see, I think, big things in his future, and not just because he's a large human. No, Asp- Aspinall is going to be good. The, t- the upper part of heavyweight is so good. I don't include Marcin Tybora in there, and that's why I didn't like this. We Fair got enough. we got he- upper upper echelon heavyweight versus and not so much, and it showed. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I made my thoughts clear on it last week, but the one thing we didn't talk about last week is so now we have Tom and Aspinall got his win. He's on the right track once again. Everything that happened in the last year, he can move away from. Looking ahead, what's the over-under? Let's say, I'm going to set the over-under at 12 months for Tom Aspinall. You know, 12 and a half months, we'll say within a year, right? 12 and a half months for Tom Aspinall to have his first UFC title fight. Oh, over for sure. Over? Over. I mean, does interim count? That's the Absolutely only... does count. Okay, if interim counts, there's a chance. See, that's why that's the thing. But, you have to that factor okay. that in. If if you factor in interim, I think there's a chance under twelve. But if it's for the real belt, no shot. Over easy. I think that's probably accurate. Yeah, if we're, if we're gonna make the two distinctions, yeah, mm-hmm. it's possible. But honestly, I wouldn't even necessarily say that that's that's not the case either. Because let let's let's think this through. Let's think John Jones goes out there. And let's say he beats Stipe Miocic. Stipe right. is not going to come back right away anytime soon. No. He might even be done fighting at that point. Who mm-hmm. knows? John Jones, talking about potentially retiring after that. Let's say he goes through with that. They He, he doesn't have the belt anymore. They want to put together a title fight. Tom Aspinall went out there and he said, hey, I want to face the winner of... Uh, it's it's Cyril Gan and... and uh, Spivak. Sergey Spivak, thank you. He said he wants the winner of that fight. And then he wants John Jones. But in theory, if John Jones isn't there anymore, you can put... Tom Aspinall and the winner of that fight potentially for a uh, an interim or not an interim it would be a vacant title fight I mean, or it, it, Pavlovich. Sergey Pavlovich yeah Pavlovich is going to be the guy in the fight he's one half of that title fight the other half I have no idea who it's going to be might not even be Tom Aspinall okay but it's possible I that's the thing I I absolutely see it as a possibility I will say I will say over in both in both cases but. It would not surprise me if it ended up being uh, within 12 months we have a Tom Aspinall UFC heavyweight title fight of some variety. Okay. And I don't see John Jones being the type to leave his gloves in the ring. I don't see that happening as his way of retiring. So I think it will be a long, dragged out process of him. I mean, he could easily just that. retire and not put the gloves down. He could uh, but just I'm, do saying, it his own I'm way. saying he's not, it's, he's not going to make it official the night of that. I fight. see. I see. It, I never it, know. It's going to be a long, dragged out process. Could be. John's going to do it the way he's going to do it. That it would, is for sure. It would be nice if, you know, he would keep fighting and fight out that eight fight deal. <laughs> that <laughs> was never intended to finish. No. Just so he couldn't get signed elsewhere. Correct. Basically. That is exactly so. right. Um, Yeah. You know, that's probably all we really had to say about that one. The only other thing I really wanted to touch upon before we got into contested rounds uh, and the unanimity, unanimity report was Paul Craig, who I thought made a good impression down at uh, at middleweight going down to from light heavyweight for the first time in the UFC obviously didn't start off very good for him and he had to rally to get the win but he I think looks like he might make some really interesting middleweight fights there which is something in and of itself because middleweight fights are not always very interesting (laughs) well it's smart of him to go to middleweight because middleweight's a disaster um I don't think he looked that all that great until you know he was he was on the uh receiving end of uh a foul, so he, you know, a little fortune there to get him back on the feet and then, you know, back into the offensive mode instead of just getting punched. And he got a good finish. But yeah, I, I agree. He should make some interesting, you know. Fun fights is yeah. kind of what middleweight needs and doesn't get. So I think that would be nice. But the one thing, and this is why I really bring up Paul Craig, is he called out Bo Nickel. Well, if he wants to smoke, he can get it. Let's him and Bo, I mean, he's going to lose, obviously. Uh, to Bo. Do you like the sound yeah. of that fight, though? Is that a fight you yeah, like? To, you to, actually like? Do you like that as like the next step for for? I mean, uh, I heard uh, Drakus was got hurt, right? Drakus apparently he he is hurt. It sounds like they're going to do Adesanya against. Uh, yeah, so that, Sean Strickland. So unfortunately, that's not the fight that should have been made. It should have been Bo Nickel and Adesanya for the belt. Bo Nickel doesn't want to um, fight again this year. Well, what are you going to do? You need he, maybe he needs a break. Yeah, that's true. He's Prospects still... usually shouldn't be fighting too often. Paul Craig would. I know. Be I know you hate name. it when guys fight too many times in a year. That's one of your big pet peeves. Here's the thing: the guy's developing. <laughs> when he come, when he comes back, he would he he would tear through everybody. Paul Craig's in trouble if he really wants to fight Bo Nickel. That's that's not a good matchup for him. You sir are bending the rules very very so, uh, distinctly outside of your norm. No, Bo Bo would fight if he had to fight this year, but he doesn't want to. He doesn't need to. 
It's very. It's he's very a prospect. Of course, he needs. You know to. why he doesn't? Because they don't give him any good fights. He should be. If they said you're fighting who you're supposed to fight, Israel Adesanya, right now, he'd fight here. <laughs> but he's not doing. I mean, they're they're trying to bring him along too slowly. It's, it's like just throw him into the, throw him into the fire. He's ready for it. Let's I, go. I can smell it. You are going to turn on Bo Nickel in a few years. Not you a are shot. absolutely going not to turn a shot. on. Him. Yep. Not a shot. One day he's going to be like. I just didn't feel like fighting this year. I think I'm done. And you'll be like, what? You're holding things up. I'll probably be in those conversations when we make that decision. <laughs> but I, I think it's a, it's a good call out for Paul Craig because he, he he thinks he can win. He can't. But he good for him thinking it. I think it'd be a nice test because obviously Paul Craig has, has some issues sometimes t- absorbing damage and Bo Nickel hits hard. And also him being a willing grappler. Let's see how he can do with somebody who wants to bring it down there as well. Mm-hmm. A wrestler, often these guys can neutralize. But hey, I mean, does he have enough experience to mine himself against somebody um, who is as adept, especially with triangles, off his back as Paul Craig? We are. I think right. that's interesting. We point. will drill triangle defense and nothing else. <laughs> we say we like he's your buddy. Yeah, we are buddies. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. The only knock on him is he went to Penn State. That's the only knock outside of that. What do you have against po- uh, Penn State? Oh, I think you know. No. Yeah. Papa, uh, uh, Paterno. Oh, Joe Pa. Yeah, no, yeah, Joe Pa and, and Sandusky. Well, okay. The, the yeah, university's dead to me. No, that's fair. Yeah, it's, sure. It's dead to me. Root nothing but the worst things for that university. So you want you want Sad Valley, not Happy Valley. Yes. Okay, got it. Um, let's move on, though, to the unanimity report, which every time I try to say it quickly, unanimity. I completely stumble over. Scott can't say unanimity. Not not quickly. I can say unanimity, but I can't say it quickly. Unanimity. 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 Cumulative. No, no, this is terrible. Cumulative. This is, this is bad listening. This is bad listening. Sorry, guys. Not going to uh, <laughs> The unanimity. Shut up. <laughs> Good Lord. The graphic was wrong. <laughs> okay, I said yes. it first. Yes. So yes, Dan Dan is pointing out that the, I missed one round. The graphic in the unanimity report is in fact incorrect. We missed did the one math round. wrong. Uh, we we actually have a twenty two out of thirty uh, ratio here from the event in London, which means a seventy three point three percent agreement rate, unanimous rate here, perfectly on average. This is solid job. Uh, one of these rounds was an eight nine split. So, um, yeah, yeah. Everybody makes mistakes. Big Bird taught me that as a little boy. Big I, Bird I told you. I, I wonder whose round I missed. Apologize if I did. I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I'm trying to count real quick. Well, it was definitely a unanimous round. It's not. It's not important. Oh, actually, the individual rounds are correct. It's just the total rounds I missed one. So all I your see. all your individual numbers are correct. So you just don't do basic math. Well. That's true. Arithmetic is an issue. Sounds like you'll be a good uh, MMA scorekeeper. Yeah. <laughs> In Australia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an oldie but a baddie. <laughs> Not a patty baddie. Anyway, let's go to Who was in rounds. attendance. Who was? Yes, of course he would have been. Why wouldn't he? He got be? called out too. By, he, was, he, by was, Parsons. he came out to support his friend. He got called out by Parsons. That would be a fun Johnny fight. Johnny Parsons, yeah. That would be fun. I mean, there's a lot of fights that make sense for patty pimblet from a competitive standpoint but mm. at this point he's probably got to fight somebody who's going to crush him mm. it's probably just going to happen sooner than Most later likely. yeah uh let's get to get tested rounds we got eight rounds like i said you know, to, to help you with the master uh it is 22 uh take away take that away from 30 you got eight That's we have eight point. rounds yeah we got eight rounds 73 yeah. percent. you did have the eight correct that was that was the part that was right from yeah before, at least so what are you no. gonna do yeah, these, things happen. these things happen in mma <laughs> As I often like to say. But yeah, let's go to contested rounds. Uh, we do have one split decision, so we're going to start off with that one. Daniel Marcos got the win over Davy Grant, local uh, favorite, of course. Split decision, like we said, 29-28. All three ways, just one of them went to Grant, two of them went to Marcos. And round one is where we are split, uh, with two going to Marcos and three going to Grant. Let's talk about round one, sir. What's happening? Uh, this is a pretty low output round. Uh, both seem to be throwing good calf kicks. Grant is the one pressing forward a bit, but still not oh, uh, still not much coming from either guy. A lot of kicks in general, yeah. I think Marco's got a, a tad bit better results with his strikes, a tad more effective, landing a nice right at the very end of the round that helped, and a kick to the legs. Uh, he kicked out the legs out earlier. Dropped. Uh, I don't. Do they even count? They don't count that as a knockdown. I don't I think don't it's a, well. First off, for it's the UFC, gonna... for the UFCs, they're the only one who really cares about that. Yeah. It's it's not like the judges sitting there like, no, oh, yeah. was that a knockdown? Right, it's not a knockdown, but I, I was just more of a way for me to explain it. Sure, 
like he's just kicking the legs out and Grant's falling through his I don't think that out. I don't think yeah. for the UFC stats purposes they do count that as a knockdown. Okay. I don't think so. Uh anyway, it's a low output. I, you can't be upset either way, but I scored it for Marcos ten nine. Yeah, I did too. Um it, it's definitely a low enough output. And and yeah, it's just it's really just like a whole lot of kicks back and forth for a while. You know, there's some punches thrown in here mm. and there, but it's it's a very kicky round, a lot of kind of tepidness from them actually kind of really committing to doing more than just the kicks so yeah i'm with you but i don't really have a problem with it going the other way so we ended up in the majority agreeing with daryl ransom and clemens verner it was anders olsen who saw it for grant and and hey that's fine yeah i'm 100 so, fine with that just unfortunate that you have a round like this that decides the fight because maybe these guys had tried to push a little more in those five minutes maybe they can take it yeah well i thought round two was actually very close as well. I ended up scoring it for Grant. No judge did. It was more competitive. Um, like it was more like and there was a little more to it. I right? felt I felt there was there was more outrage about this fight than any. And I was like, I mean, you can't be upset oh, it's about a split. this split. That's often what happens, yeah, you know. You can't get upset split about this decision, fight. Yeah. I no. said, here's my. I said, as outside of round three, if that wasn't unanimous, I'd say that was probably that would probably be a bit of an issue mm-hmm. because round three was the clearest round of the three in my eyes. Sure. So. But that they were, they were, and that's also so. what happens. Though Grant won that round. Yeah. When you have a round that's definitive and two rounds that are like close, mm-hmm. that's often what happens. Is the, the people will sit there and say, especially if it's the last round, they'll say, "Well, mm-hmm. obviously he ended on a good note, and he he had the most, he had the round that was most definitive. He should just win the fight." And that's not how scoring works. Obviously. Well, clearly you're, su- you're supposed to go back. Episodes. Yeah, you're supposed to go back and change your scores for round one and round two. Because the guy in round three had to be a good round. That's what you're supposed to do. Yes. Clearly. Duh. <laughs> Why are you laughing? All right, we can move on. Uh, <laughs> like I said, that was, that was the only split there. I don't think that this really, on the whole, just wasn't a a big judging outrage event. Which no, is good. I mean, should, that's a good thing. Really we don't want be. it to be. But, um, yeah, we can, we can move on to the only fight that actually had two rounds uh, with contested rounds in here with split rounds. Rounds two and three of Bruno Brazil's unanimous decision victory over Shauna Bannon. 29-28 twice and a 30-27 all for a Brazil. Let's go to round two first. Let's start here. Uh, pretty even on the feet. A bunch of the rounds spent in a, a stalemated clinch. Both landing some knees. No one really gaining an edge there. I do think Brazil was more impactful when they were at distance. You, you know, you got Bannon's kind of just jumping around. Um, she got a... Uh, Brazil got a late takedown, straight to half guard, landed a couple smaller elbows, kind of was like, yep, that's my round. I was like, yep, that's your round. 10-9. <laughs> yeah, that's your round. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I did see it the same way as you for, for Brazil, but, but yeah, not crazy to go the other way. I don't think so at all. Um, you you definitely want to see them do a little more than clinch and trade knees like that. Yeah, they just, just... They spent so much time there, like. No one really separating themselves from anything. I mean, in those situations, though, at least you can kind of try to say, okay, who's landing the knees that look like they're they're landing more impactfully? It's not it's not an easy thing to parse through, especially you and I sitting at home. Mm-hmm. You know, at least people who are there, especially if they happen to be at the panel that's closest to it, they can they can tell a little bit more. You know, mm-hmm. but uh, or I imagine I'm I'm sitting here saying that like I've sat in the chair. I don't know that, but I've sat close enough to a fight to at least know that mm-hmm. too. So um, I'm going to use my educated uh extrapolation there to, to figure that yeah, out right. but, but yeah so we saw it in the in the majority for brazil same as anders olsen in this case and uh clemens verner but it was mike bell who split off to see this one for bannon and again not crazy to go that way just there wasn't enough happening well said we can move on to round three now yeah i think bannon finally started to fight here she's actually landing a bit better here actually wobbled brazil late that led to another near stalemate clinch situation i do think bannon actually did have the better offense in the clinch not by a lot but already she'd created that situation for herself you know it was yeah. it, it was it was a defensive kind of thing right mm-hmm. this, is, this is a good sign of like hey she did something that needed to be adjusted to <laughs> sure talking about her actually fighting what talking about her actually starting to fight this time yeah okay well i meant i mean yeah. to, oh. to particularly kind of sting her right because then it led to oh that. yeah yeah that's yeah, what yeah, i really yeah, yeah. yeah okay i got you yeah, with about 30 seconds left, Brazil drops her to the ground, uh, lands like two decent shots. It wasn't enough for me to swing it, but uh, I could understand it. But I'm 10-9 Bannon. No, I'm here with Bannon, too. I mean, it's not crazy to go the other way, but I I, I felt like this was a round where at least she had success. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. rather than 
you know, any sort of either losing the round or potentially just stalemating. I felt like there was actual success here, you know, and mm-hmm. that was that was big for her. So I ended up going that way as well, um, largely because of that sequence that we kind of talked about it. And uh, otherwise, yeah, not a whole lot happening, but you can go the other way. So we saw it the same way as Clemens Werner, who was the out judge here with uh, Bell and Olsen seeing it for Brazil in a round that, again, at this point, as, as we already have two judges that have two rounds to none. In favor of Brazil, it's not mm-hmm. going to change the result here. But either way, I think I think Bannon took it here. So what does that mean for Judge Werner? Couch side override. Meow, 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 meow. <laughs> Gonna have to mail that one overseas. That has no chance of getting there. I'm sorry. The Postal Service can't mail things to like North Jersey from North Jersey. Mm-hmm. It's not getting to Germany. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. Judge Werner. It's just not happening. <laughs> We're trying. We're trying. I'm telling you. I'm gonna. Maybe we should negotiate with the uh, the postal service. See if we can get we them could. to do yeah. some sort of special thing where they actually get the couch side overrides where they're supposed to go. Like we'll add an extra stamp or something, and they'll be like, okay. Yeah, that's probably what'll do it. Mm-hmm. Just it, they've been waiting all this time for one extra stamp. <laughs> <laughs> God, and that reminds me. I hope. Uh, I hope that Pokemon card that I sold the other day gets out where it's supposed to go. Tell, did I tell you about that one? Yeah, Alakazam. Alakazam sold it for six hundred bucks, guys. If you have, if you're listening at home and you have your old Pokemon cards, you might be sitting on a gold mine, Trebek. You gotta, you gotta try this. Yeah, it's a sour subject for me. Oh, I'm sorry. I was like 14. I got, I got swindled so bad at a card show. Ugh. God, this guy just took straight advantage. Sold my whole set for like 120 bucks. Whole original first series, hundred dollars. 120 bucks. I was like, yeah, oh yeah, give me 120 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> I, my heart goes out to you, sir. And and honestly, if you're listening, please throw a little prayer my, my buddy's way here. I think he could use it. Let's move on, though. We were no more Pokemon cards. This isn't a Pokemon show. Uh, Gotta catch them all now. Chris Duncan, moving on to the next fight here, got the win over Yanala Schmooze. 30-27 twice and a 29-28 for Duncan. It was round two where we had a debate uh, among the judges here. To potentially give it to Ashmoos. So what's happening here? Uh, Duncan's continuing to land well. You know, he's pressing forward. Really looking really good. Like, very comfortable in there. Building a pretty comfortable lead. Later in the round is, is where Ashmoos... You know, he landed a couple bigger strikes, including that spinning kick to the head that was blocked. But, you know, still solid impact to it. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but other than that, he doesn't have much in the round. I really find a, a, a tough way to, to say he won this round. It's Duncan for me, 10-9. It's definitely harder to give it to Ashmoos here. I do think that middle part of the frame that you're talking about there is some tangible success you know it's not absurd to give it mm-hmm. to a schmooze but man I, I i think duncan is is not wounding him but he's certainly tagging him a few times like pretty good and i, I think it's to the point where i don't think a schmooze was able to um balance the ledger let alone overtake it so yeah, I, I feel pretty good about this one being a Duncan round. You know, maybe maybe Janitro Camijo is seeing or not seeing certain things landing. I don't know. Possibly. You know, anytime there's, there's a lot of movement, you just don't know. But I, I would I would think that most judges are probably going to watch a round like this and say this one goes to Duncan. That's that's kind of what I would say here. Um, and I feel good about it giving it to Duncan, too. So mm-hmm. you and I saw it. Uh, the same as David Leatherby and Daryl Ransom. Again, it was Kamijo who was on his own here. We do not have uh, an in-doubt fight in any way. But yeah, I, I, I think, again, I, I think I I feel pretty good about saying that, yeah, most judges probably sitting in the chair are, are unobstructed going to give that one to Duncan. That's just what I mm-hmm. would think. Could be wrong. But yeah, we can we can move on, though, to the next round here. We can probably keep this breezy right there's nothing crazy going on in any yeah, of these rounds I suppose. Uh, although there's one thing we, we can bring up in the next yeah, fight we after we get to the round here let's let's start with the contested round though joel alvarez got the win over mark de by a round two submission with a brabo choke officially uh round it's one just, it's course. a darse i know i'm not as good at explaining the differences or non-differences between the two so there isn't a difference <laughs> it's just a different name one per- you prefer to say bravo or you say- prefer to say darse oh i said brabo too so, yeah you yeah. didn't even say it right that's all right it's okay i mean i wouldn't i mean i'm not the, the grammar police hey i was practicing how to say uh one of the judges names on this fight too so I'll, i'm gonna say that in my pocket for after you explain what happened in round one and I hey know, what happened in round one i know how to say their name well i will hear you first yeah. then so but give me tell us what happened in round one come on I mean, it was a pretty good battle on the feet both were throwing hard but alvarez is the one that's landing the better strikes good leg kicks as well i don't see the strongest case for jacasey i mean i thought alvarez was bopping his head pretty good um but it's all right, whatever. 10-9 Alvarez. <laughs> it's all right, whatever. Yeah. 
who gives an f <laughs> I, well i think the more interesting thing comes out after uh, sure. in the finishing sequence so. no i i get it i but yeah i i i think i'm with you i i think this is this looks like an alvarez round to me it feels like an alvarez round to me not egregious maybe to go the other way yeah, but, but 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 yeah I, I would say it's probably more than close but clear okay but it's, i don't I, I don't know somewhere between close but clear and clear okay. i don't know what that would be 10 eight and a half competitive <laughs> but clear not 10 eight and a half but you know what i mean yeah i don't know <laughs> I, yeah, maybe competitive but clear. Who knows? <laughs> um, but yeah, so we saw it the same way uh, as Ben Cartledge and David Letheby. It was Cesare Wojciechowski mm-hmm. who saw this one for Jacquesi. Is that what you were going to say? I was going to say, uh, I know how to say his name because it's Cesaro from WWF. Oh, <laughs> but it's not spelled the same way. No, but it's the same it's the same idea. Well, it's the, it's the same name. It's Caesar. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that would be my assumption there anyway. Cesare. Uh, yeah. Cesare. We'll go with that. I don't know. I don't speak Polish very well or at all. So there's that. I did just speak to uh, someone with legendary Polish power, though. Oh, mm-hmm. Jan Blachowicz. He you parks heard of this in guy? the parking lot. Yes, yes. He he <laughs> runs a business in North Jersey called Jan Fence. <laughs> it's not Jan. It's definitely Jan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that car was gone for like I was a uh, little backstory for everybody. I I park in a little parking lot very close to Dan's house when I come over and record. And I walk over, and every every time I go to this parking lot, most times this car for what I always say is yawn fence uh, is always parked there. But for a while, it wasn't there. I wasn't seeing it for a while, and all of a sudden, after I interview or right before I interview Jan Blahovich, who I know when I'm speaking to him is actually in the country, that all of a sudden this car is back. <laughs> so I'm going to assume that Jan took the car with him back to Poland and then came back. Not only to train and, and get ready for the fight and get acclimated, but also to run his fencing business in North Jersey. Most likely. Yeah. And that's for uh, everyone at home who didn't care, but you're getting that anyway. Enjoy. Uh, moral of the story is I'm not good at pronouncing Polish. <laughs> there. <laughs> Roundabout way. But but that's not the only thing we wanted to talk about from this fight. Yeah. This finishing sequence was, uh, was kind of... Uh... Unfortunate. I think is it. At I least guess unfortunate is the right word. It's a, yeah, it's a good way to at least start it off. Unfortunate for Jacquesi, they had an accidental clash of heads, which obviously leads to him getting finished. He was in a bad way. Yeah, he had the, he had the forehead of Alvarez kind of landed on like the base of the neck of Jacquesi. That's what it yeah, looked back like. Yeah, back of the head, yeah, like, back of the head, base of the neck, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, where it meets. And he was he was definitely he an illegal portion. Not that it was intentional. Definitely a diminishing uh, situation there. And, and an unfortunate keep, keep fighting situation, too. It, it was kind of weird because Alvarez, like, keep fighting? Okay. Yeah, I he mean, just went look, back. he's like, all right, I guess I got to keep fighting. Alvarez ahead. deserves nothing. He he is blameless here. Mm-hmm. He did what he's supposed to do. You know, he backked off for a second and said, keep fighting. He's like, okay, that's what you, that's the job. So, you know, and, it, and I think Michael Bisping, I think, probably accurately pointed out on the broadcast that the referee in this case, Dan Mobahedi, right? Mm-hmm. Dan Mobahedi, um, may not have even in, been in quite the position to see the way they landed not that this ref was out of position but it just the way they landed was such an awkward way it was like it, you kind of had to be in the right spot to probably see it i can imagine so I, you know kudos to michael bisping for pointing that out i think he's right um but the unfortunate part here is that now we have a result that very clearly came because of a compromised opponent from an uh, you know an otherwise illegal strike um mm-hmm. i would hope that there is some sort of way in which this can be appealed. I know it's overseas. I know the UFC um, often acts as its own commission. I know England does not have its own commission, but they have the, the, you know, the English MMA organization out there is trying to, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't work the same way as commissions, right? Mm. I'm still hazy on, on what they can and cannot do. Um, I'm sure we know people who could, educate us on on this type of topic too and hopefully we'll fight here from some people on that but i do hope that there is some recourse for at least jack Casey to maybe have his due and having this reviewed and it might potentially get overturned into a no contest again i don't, I don't think the referee should be like blamed here but it does seem like an unfortunate sequence of events that maybe could have been handled different i mean it's just the way yeah they had i mean you know put replay in play there yeah yeah, that would have been yeah. nice, for sure. Uh, it's just, you don't see the back of the head hit the front of the head very often. No, it's a weird a thing. Crash, so it's, 
really no fault, just an unfortunate situation. But I mean, I, so. I do kind of hope that they can actually make this be a no contest. I actually really mm. hope that because it, it, it just it doesn't sit right. Well, the way he was after after the fight, you would you would imagine this probably would have stopped it. So mm. what are you going to do? No, nah, nothing now. But I guess that'll be worth kind of keeping an eye on if we. Yeah. And if we get an answer on that, we should uh, we should share that next week. We can move on. We don't have to linger on this one anymore. Let's go. Probably probably can even rattle some of these off pretty quickly at this point, right? Johnny Parsons got a round two TKO victory over Danny Roberts. Interesting second round, too. We're not going to talk about that one. Um, but round one is a split round, so let's talk about that. Yeah, good battle on the feet. Roberts seems to be getting the better of it early. Some good combos, good kicks, but Parsons landed some pretty good strikes of his own. He landed a few heavy ones at the end of the round. But I do think Roberts edged it ten nine. No, this is a ten seven for Parsons. <laughs> I was, this is a this is an in joke that I was I was messing with Dan for. I said I was going to go against him when, when he told me what he scored. So, but no, I actually do see it the same way as him I, as, as you, Dan. I see it as a ten nine for Roberts, but close, close, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there, there's there's enough land that I think on Parsons end that that you can start thinking about it that way. But I, I feel good with my Roberts score here. All right. Uh, same as Mike Bell. Same as Dow Ransom. It was uh, Janitro Camijo once again, the out judge here. But yeah, not not crazy. For sure. And then moving on to Fresh Zium got the win over Jai Herbert. Unanimous nod, 29 28 twice, and a 30 27. But it's round two that is a split round that actually makes it so that the fight comes down to round three. Uh, so let's talk about round two. Uh, a really close round. I thought Zium uh, was the better striker. I thought he's landing more immediately impactful shots. A ton of this round is spent on the cage where pretty much negligible. Like no one's getting an edge either way. Uh, I think ZM does edge the striking at distance, uh, even if not much time was spent there. So I'm 10-9 ZM. No, I I went the other way, though. I actually did have this one for Herbert. Very close. Hard to get mad either way, right? But uh, I I thought he maybe had a little bit more of the higher points and and still very close, realistically. Okay. Um, But yeah, so I was in the majority in that one. I saw it like Mike Bell and uh, Cesare Wojciechowski, and you saw it uh, with Judge Camillo. Last round here, and this one's our 8-9 split. Lerone Murphy got the clear victory over Josh Kulabau. 30-26 twice and a 30-27. We have the discrepancy over the degree of round three victory for Murphy. So what's happening here? So up until this point, it's kind of even a little bit. Not even, more so. Murphy, probably a slight edge until he lands this grazing body kick that completely shuts Kulabau down. From there, it's just good ground and pound Uh Two tight Darsh chokes defended by Kulbao. But Kulbao, from this point forward, is just completely defensive. I do think we got good damage and dominance, decent duration. I think this is a 10 8. I like it for the 10 8 too. Um, I don't think Kulbao does nearly enough to earn his 9 in any meaningful way either. You know, it's not like mm. he, he is doing much to stay in this or fight. It, it, it looks like he's basically just hanging on and, and maybe hoping to get to the, get to the final horn. Yeah, oh, he's, he's just a totally different fighter after this. Like, he's just done. Kind of. This feels like what so. an eight should be. I, I feel good with an eight here. So yeah, I, I agreed with you. I saw it. Uh, with we saw it. I should say with uh, judges Ben Cartledge and Daryl mm-hmm. Ransom, and it was David Letheby uh, who gave the nine here. And that and that's surprising actually because David Letheby is often one more likely to give an eight by the data that I. Keep. Well, here's the I didn't I didn't see where where he was seating, but I know the commentary team had no idea why Coolabout went down. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's a good chance, maybe a possibility he didn't see. What put Kulabau down? Sure, glancing, glancing shot. Yeah, a, a um, strike like that. It was a so, weird. It was a kind of a weird strike, right? In, in the way it landed. So you, you just never know. Um. So if you don't see it, I mean, that's the biggest. That's the reason everything happens. If you yeah. don't see that, I mean, you can't it just might only be a nine. There. You can't just so, extrapolate what might yeah. have happened. You have to actually have identified the strike yourself, right? Because you have to be able to defend that score. Mm-hmm. So that makes sense. But yeah, I, I you know, with the benefit of of. Uh, both hindsight and watching from home and having different camera angles and all that. Yeah, I, I would say I would say 10-8. Yep. And that is it for contested rounds. We did have six finishes out of 15 fights. This is too many fights. They should do they should limit it to 12. Cards should be limited at 12. 15 is just excessive. Roster limits. So cut them. Roster limits. I don't, there we go. Yeah, exactly. 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 Let's just say exactly a billion times. You get 20 fighters a division and that's it. Right, Everyone well, else insane. is a free agent. That's insane. So you get I, that's what you got. You can't just lock up fighters and hope something sticks. This is not 
the WWE, we don't need enhancement talent, <laughs> aka jobbers. I don't think we have jobbers. Let's I go. think we have an, an an excess of prospects. Yeah, I I equate it more to like a like a major major league uh, minor league system, right? But. Everyone is on the major league roster instead of, you know, starting at like high A and low A and double A and triple A. Everyone's on the 40 man. Oh, it's more than the 40 fair? man. No, no, no. It's, it's, it should be. Well, that's what we should do. Fair enough. And the thing is, we're using the word prospect too loosely. A lot of people aren't going to turn out to be anything. Well, in theory, they're all prospects. No, prospect means they might be something. Eh. They got a shot. I suppose. No, it's not this yet. I can go on forever. <laughs> so six finishes. Six finishes. <laughs> Three of them by TKO or KO. I think it was all actual specific TKO. I don't think we had a straight knockout uh, distinction on any of them, but there were three submissions and, and three fights ended in the first round. So three, three, three. What was your favorite of all of these uh, six finishes? Well, I was going to say it was Alvarez over Jacasey. Mm-hmm. And then you're not Which, going but to. It is a ni- it is a nice finish. You can't fault Alvarez for anything there. But kind of the execution of it, yeah. maybe maybe still can be appreciated. Yeah, it was. Yeah, but after, I can but understand that how he how he got there. I kind of like it, so I switch it. Okay, to Julia Stolyarenko ripping Julia Ma- Julia Julia Gulia, right? But so, the, it's Julia Ju- Gulia. Julia Gulia from uh, Wedding Singer. Yeah. Anyway, Meatball Molly losing an arm um, <laughs> in her hometown. I mean, it, it, it was she didn't lose her arm. She came home with it. I guess. I mean, she almost didn't. Yeah, so, that's, I mean, that's true. that was a nasty armbar. It was, and yeah, that's all I gotta say about that. that's my favorite. Actually, why I'm glad you did bring that up because I, I do want to highlight um one one thing that you had actually brought up to me. Mm-hmm. We were talking about the finish to that fight, and you were saying, you know, you know, how Molly's tapping out for a while. Molly McCann's mm-hmm. tapping for a little bit. Jason Herzog is the referee here, and it does take a little bit for him to get into it. And if you don't think about it that much, you wonder, well, why did that happen, right? Mm-hmm. And you can understand, like, hey, it probably does go a little long, right? So. I just happened to have seen, though, because Jason Herzog, we often see him uh, interacting on social media, you know, usually an hour or two after the fights, right? Great referee, by the way. Still, I, I, I would say, uh, I would say he's he's probably the the fight the referee that I would feel most comfortable with officiating my fight. Mm-hmm. Put it that way. Um, but there was, uh, let's say some, let's say some Twitter rando writes, Jason Herzog is a good ref. But McCann shouldn't have had to tap seven times before the fight was stopped. And uh, and Herzog replies or quote tweets to this saying, yes, caught me pivoting around to make space. Definitely should have been there sooner, exclamation point. And that makes sense, especially when you go back and watch the footage. You don't get a whole lot of good views of where Jason Herzog is, but you can kind of tell where his feet are at one point and then where they are at another point and extrapolate the momentum that it took to get there as a potential reason why, hey, it's tough to get there. It's not like he's diving in to push someone off like it's a KO or a TKO. He can't just, like, intervene. Someone's having their arm leverage, so it's not like he could dive on top and be like, stop! Yeah, you know what I noticed? I don't think Jason Herzog wears socks. I never paid that much attention because, to his well, feet. Because, you honestly had to because that's all they had of him okay. in this shot. Is sure. I, I just remember seeing his lower half of his leg. I'm like, yeah, I don't think Herzog wears socks. What else can I you describe? That was interesting. Further describe his uh, his um, his feet and shoe and shoes to me. Well, he was wearing uh, oh. uh, he was wearing black sneakers. Okay, and I don't think he he had socks. On. What brand were they? What what company? Oh, uh, I don't remember. Mm-hmm. I would have to. I would guess maybe Reebok. But so I'm you don't sure. think he was wearing any socks? I don't know. I mean, they could be super low ankle. He could have just been wearing like the the you know the, the no shows possibly. Uh, they're not quarter length. Uh, quarter length. They're uh, like what I wear. And I, I tend to wear lower socks, but there's even lower that. I don't like to wear anymore. They're a no show. They're not called no show. They're called no show. Stop that. Hundred percent no show. I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. Google it. Anyway, I'm I'm done engaging with Jason Herzog's feet and footwear. Well, but um, I do want to bring one, one more point. What's up? Do you remember when we were we were taught you're supposed to try to you know go opposite the fulcrum point when you're stopping a sub when you're when you're calling the end of it? Yeah. Do you remember that? I, that's the one point. I, I was like, oh, I would have thought he would have pushed on the elbow going the other way. But I think part of the problem is again he's not really in the position to do that. Yeah, His body's moving in such a way that it's a problem. It actually, the explanation that he that is provided here, it makes a lot of sense to yeah. me. Yeah. Right. So you know, as as obviously as unfortunate it is, and there's there's some at least uh, regret expressed here. I I get it. I get it. You know, you can't be a perfect machines. Don't do this. They can't be perfect either. So yeah, it's unfortunate that it happened, but it just seems like that's just the nature of the beast in some ways. So. All right. Yeah. What was your favorite? My favorite finish. 
Yep. Oh, okay. I thought we were going to talk about favorite uh, like footwear on the uh, on the referee. Oh. I, I thought that Mark Goddard had some really neat socks. I didn't see his socks. Yeah, I didn't either. I just made that up. Uh, my favorite finish was Paul Craig, actually, because not that it was like super or anything like that. I, I didn't. I didn't fall in love with uh, any of the finishes in this particular card like we do sometimes this week. But but I just I liked the idea of him being able to rally from being down and out and not just with a Hail Mary sub or like, you know, he, he obviously locks in these triangles that sometimes can turn the fight very quickly. Right. This time it was with his hands, at least and elbows, elbows, especially. Um, I, I liked seeing that. I think that was that was a nice finish from Paul Craig. Mm. And a good way to debut. And and Andre Muniz, I mean, he had a lot of potential and a lot of uh he was a prospect. He was a prospect. And he's a legit prospect. Though. But not as much anymore. I think the shine is dull, man. He's it's lost two in fighter. a row. Yeah, but he's just lost two in a row now to guys who are, you know, one would probably think at the lower end of the top fifteen in the UFC. Yeah, I mean he w- he was on his way to winning. Yes. He was just stupid. And then he lost. So I don't know. I don't know if that's that not, uh, that big of a knock as far as he's his lost, skill or he's where he lost belongs. two in a row, though, man. That's when things start to look a little less du- less less shiny. Is all I'm really saying. I'm not saying he can't even turn around and become the champion one day. Even the greatest fighter Probably of all not, time though. has lost two in a row. Who? Jim Miller. <laughs> and he's come back and look at him. You're right. He's he's got a lot of so, finishes lately, and he is probably the number one fighter of all time. Exactly. <laughs> I love Jim Miller, man, but. <laughs> Stopping. Just speaking facts. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, that that's all I had to say about UFC London. I think we can move on and look ahead to a very busy coming weekend here. UFC two ninety one would be the main attraction. This is over in Salt Lake City in Utah. Yeah, Utah's getting a good one. Utah's gonna bring in, you know, probably a lot of good traveling judges like they did last time, but they did mix in some of their local uh officials as well, which I I, I remember them doing it a pretty in a in a good way, like a, a nice mixed in way on the prelims mm. last time. I thought that was the, the the good way to do it. There's some commissions do it kind of strange, especially when they don't get uh UFC cards very often. But I think I think they did a good job. It feels like Salt Lake City is going to be like a staple for a while. It might be. So it might be, which is funny because a while back I went to a John Jones fight mm. against Vladimir Matyushenko on versus on versus. Yep. I was there in San Diego. This fight card was originally supposed to be in Utah, and it moved. Do you remember the reason? I could swear it was something to do with attendance, but I I could be <laughs> wrong about that. I I really could be. I, I'm gonna try and look that up as we go here, but, um, but yeah, I mean the headliner here, it's technically a championship fight. It is the BMF. But how do you feel about the BMF belt? Well, you the, talk about that while I look this up. Uh, the true BMF fighter isn't in the fight. Uh, the BMF uh title holder isn't in the fight, so I think it's the interim BMF title. See, I I had always thought of the in my mind, I picture the BMF belt to be something that's like it's a prize for that moment in time it's not something that gets defended it's not something that gets passed around it's just hey it's almost like in the pfl they do a championship every year right it's like it's that year's bmf t- champion you know? i guess i mean but the, you should be able to defend your title as the bmf which nate diaz isn't getting the chance to oh that's true um so but he lost uh, that fight oh uh, he didn't but <laughs> <laughs> you were incorrigible so. but, i mean dustin and, and justin are are it's going to be a fun fight. I don't think this fight needed that title to it. It just didn't need the extra because this fight's going to sell regardless. I have the answer, by the way, to go back to uh, why that event was moved from Salt Lake City. Okay. Originally. The John Jones versus Vladimir Matyushenko event was originally to take place in June 2010. It ended up only taking place on August 1st, 2010. And the reason cited, because it would have been in Salt Lake City, the reason cited was that uh, low ticket sales. That is Wow, that's wild. And that's actually like if you look at that that versus card, by the way, that, that John Jones card, it was a good card. Like there was like good talent on there. Jones, obviously, against Matt Yushenko. That was really kind of more of a showcase, but Jones was on the come up anyway. Uh Yushin Okami and Mark Munoz, that was a solid fight at the time for middleweight. Jake Ellenberger against John Howard. That was a that was an interesting fight. Takanori Gomi got his first UFC win over Tyson Griffin. Uh also on down the card here. Uh, a debuting fighter. He went on to do some stuff. Charles Oliveira. Oh yeah, that was a good. He he ended up having like a decent career. Brian Stan was Brian, on this one. Brian Stan. My favorite commentator in UFC all time. Yeah, Brian Stan was good. He was fantastic. I miss his voice on there. Him him and Anik was was easily my top twosome. Yeah, 
Uh, speaking of Anik, up that schedule, bro. <laughs> Yeah, John Gooden this time. He's good. I like John. No, John Gooden is good. Yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't expect him for this one. No. I didn't expect Anakin. Why wouldn't you? Oh, okay. Yeah. I was going to say, why wouldn't so, you expect John Gooden no, in no. London? I expect more Anik in the Apex. Fair enough. By the way, WWE superstar uh, Matthew Riddle was also on this uh, fight card. He's probably high as a kite. I uh, can only assume so. Do you uh, remember he, he trained at AMA for like... Like a week. Riddle did? Yeah. I did, oh, I didn't know that. I talked to him there. Really? Okay. He seems very high. Why wouldn't he be? He seemed extre- uh, extremely high. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to UFC 291 here. We're getting a little wait, wait, wait. What? What do you want? Is John Jones in all the controversial changes of venues? Is there anything other than this Utah to San Diego and the other one from Vegas or wouldn't do it? And so Cal- they had to do it in California last minute. They changed it. Which one is that? That was uh, the one they wouldn't. Uh, one of the one of the commissions wouldn't license him. Either California wouldn't license him, or Nevada wouldn't license him. Uh, it's escaping me. I don't remember. But you remember what I'm talking uh, about. I kind of don't, to be and honest. And then okay, well, I'm not saying I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying I don't. And remember. he was involved in 151 that never happened. Well, yeah, that was that was also true. That was the first UFC Which kinda, uh, numbered event that got canceled. It got canceled, but it also technically got moved to mm-hmm. 152 to Toronto from Vegas to Toronto. So I think three John Jones fights got canceled. I think he's got to hold the record for that. Look, if anybody's going to hold the record for some weird stuff that happens in and around fights, it's probably John Jones. Okay, fair. Yeah. I mean, he won a fight where he had a broken toe, and if it kept going, it would have been game over for his streak. <laughs> he would have lost because he was beaten up so badly on Chael Sonnen, and yet he broke his toe, so they wouldn't let him fight anymore. He would have had two of the craziest losses. Yeah. Yes, he would For have. a fighter that should be undefeated. Yeah. <laughs> By and large, yeah. Well, <laughs> not true. John Jones has beat John Jones several times. Yeah, so he still beat himself. That's a draw. He's, still, he's, he's got like four draws on his oh, record. Okay, <laughs> just in life. But anyway, we got to get back to two ninety one here. We got a lot of fights actually to talk about because there's, this is a good card outside of the BMF title. And like, not that it look the fight itself is fantastic. Justin Justin Gaethje and Dustin Poirier going at it a second time is, is just wonderful. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't need. It's the fantastic. BMF it doesn't. It, do, it. it really doesn't. I think you're absolutely right. I don't think it needs a championship. That it has one. Does it bring more shine to the fight for some people in in terms of like, ooh, there's a shiny object over here? I don't know, maybe. But look, if it gets more people to watch these two, I guess I'm okay with it. Because right. they because these these are these are the fights that we should be saying they're a non division championship main event. This is this is one that you can pay money for and say, if I have to plunk down yeah. eighty dollars to watch fights, I want this to be the last fight I watch. Yeah, but it also means something for that division. Yes, it does. It so, really does. That's true. It has relevance there. There's a lot of fights that are uh-huh. relevant. Well, maybe not a lot that have relevance, but I would say Jan Blahovich and uh, Alex Pereira has a lot more relevance now. Question on that. Hmm. Is there a bell on the line for this or no? No, there is not. At, at, as of this time, as of early Sunday morning when we're recording here, no, there's nothing. And and when I spoke to, I again, I spoke to Jan uh, earlier in the week, he had no indications that there was going to be a ch- championship on the line. I don't think they're going to make that change at any point. It feels like we're locked into three rounds here. Okay. It also feels like Jamal Hill str- losing or giving up the belt was kind of like missed. What do you mean miss? Like, it just wasn't that big a story. No, it was a big story. Feel, it just happened feel... to be on a day where there was weigh-ins. And uh, kind of, it also happened at, like, midnight, the, uh, the night yeah, before I get, weigh-ins I mean, I and just, that kind I of thing. I feel like it, like, oh, we reported it, and then that's it. We're no, done. it was a big like, thing. When Yuri had to give up the tie, I felt that was, like, a, a huge thing. That was also in the lead-up to a card. So... John, Jamal Hill's not even fighting. He didn't have a fight schedule. Oh, okay. So that, I think, has a lot to do with it. All right. You know, and then what happened was they ended up elevating a fight you know, on the undercard to be, it was Jan Blachowicz against uh, Magovan and Kalayev. They had elevated that one to mm-hmm. be for the vacant title. Mm. So there was a lot more moving parts to it. We we don't have a replacement fight for it. It's really mm-hmm. just, okay, this guy doesn't have the belt anymore. I think it was big news for the day. And then, you know, the UFC calendar is, it just moves forward. It's just a machine. It's true. It's you true. know, it's just I mean, the way yeah. it goes. So yeah. JDM's no longer the best prospect of all time. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that was several years ago. I don't even remember. What, who did he fight last time? Yeah. Yeah. It was Kevin Holland, right? Actually, Kevin Holland fights this weekend. He fights against uh, Michael Chiesa at welterweight. Um, and by the way, that blachowicz Pereira fight, I like that fight. I think it's a fun fight. That should it, be a good it fight. It does seem like the winner of that probably would be the one who fights uh, Yuri Prohaska maybe later this year for the I'm going to make a prediction in this what's fight. It, what's that? Jan does what he did to Izzy. Interesting. And it's over. Okay. He might not get a 10-8 this time, though, because of, you know, how that goes. Say, take this for but, what it is. Jan Blahovich said he would like to test his striking against Alex Pereira. He tested it against Ad- Izzy. Too. Yeah. 
So I think he he at least wants to see how this goes. He seems like he's willing to change it up and maybe isn't going to do the exact same thing that okay. uh, that Sean Strickland did, which was not smart in testing his striking against Alex Pereira. What hands down and walk forward? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't think Blahovich will do that. I think he's a little more uh, of a kind of a wily strategist in in that sense. I mean, sometimes we we've seen holes in maybe the takedown defense here and there, especially against Ankalaev later in that fight when he. Had, I mean, really, he had that fight wrapped up, and then he had man, he got mm. ten aided late in that one to, mm-hmm. to make it a draw. But anyway, I do like this fight, and I think it makes sense as a you know whether it's an official or just a de facto number one contender fight. I think it makes a lot of sense. It's nice to have a little yeah. bit more ex- added stakes to this fight, right? Like I said, Kiesa and uh, Holland, I like. I think that's a solid fight. I think probably it's going to end up being a wrestle fest, right? Kiesa and Holland, that should be. I mean, yeah, that uh, it's a probably a good grapple. If Kiesa is smart, he's going to try and take it down. Let's let's put it that way. Yeah. But Holland, I mean, if he lands. Hey, that boy has power. He does. Um, Tony Ferguson, Bobby Green. I still feel like, and this matchmaking tells me that Tony Ferguson is is at the point where he should be fighting like a Jim Miller too. And that's the fight I want. I've been saying this for a while now. Tony Ferguson and Jim Miller. No, I mean, Instead, we have Tony Ferguson and Bobby Green, which is also a fun fight. Apparently, he, apparently Scott does not like Tony Ferguson <laughs> at all. I have nothing against Tony Ferguson. It would have been fun if he, you know, fought against Khabib in that one fight that was in Brooklyn and that never happened. Oh, but, yeah. You know. That got canceled seven times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the one I'm talking about was only the second time. Okay. <laughs> uh, Steven Wonderboy Thompson against uh, Michelle Pereira. We've been waiting for this fight. Mm-hmm. Finally get it. Uh, this is a welterweight bl- uh, contest. I, I mean, I, we're going to assume they make it through the week unscathed. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully nobody trips over a cable this time. Tony Ferguson. Um that's honestly that's the whole main card main card is good this is a good main card main card is good this is this is what we want to pay 80 dollars for if it if it's not like one fight that you really got to see i think everything here is eminently watchable oh it's it's all i mean you you got jake matthews that he's gonna be fun Mm -hmm. got um that's that's on the prelims yeah these prelims yeah uh semi to gemi a Jedi is on there. Semi the Jedi. Derek Lewis and uh, Marco Sagerio de Lima. I could see that going any number of ways and being terrible, or we get somebody knocked the heck out. Yeah. That would be fun. I was just, just do it for, in five minutes, guys. I just hope for Derek Lewis to win always because I just want to interview. That's all I care about. <laughs> you just want to hear him talk. Yeah, like He's I'll talk during the week. Too, like I'll, you know? That's what I'm saying. I'll watch the, the lead up to, to this just for that. Mm-hmm. Just see if we get some gems there. Okay. But that's not the only uh, fight card we got, right? Well, I should also, before we, we switch over, I want to point out the fight that I think is most likely to wind up on our contested rounds here, and that is Trevin Giles oh. against Gabriel Bonfim. Has more to do with Giles and uh, the track record of being in these split decisions that we end up talking about? No, I'm thinking the main event. I think that's probably fair, too, so. but I, I, try, I try to like not pick the main event oh, okay. unless it's like, you have to, like, we just know it's going to be that, you know? Okay, what about... Even, try, to, try to pick a sleeper, you know? What about... Okay, so not even the low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Of, like, Miranda if Maverick and Priscilla Cashewara. Well, I, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Let's <laughs> let's say yeah. <laughs> let's say yeah. Uh, but it, as you, as you uh, alluded to, yes, this is not the only fight card happening Saturday night. Um, in what I can only describe as a, a tactical error on the part of Bellator and Ryzen to have their, what I think is a fantastic card, uh, actually go head to head with a UFC pay-per-view feels if I, if I'm understanding correctly, it is actually starting the, the showtime aired Bellator card at 11 PM Eastern time compared with the 10 PM Eastern time main card for the pay-per-view of uh, the UFC. This, I don't, I don't get it. I think this is a card that should have gone against any UFC the last three weeks. And that would have been fantastic. I, I mm. think I think this would have been the one that everyone was talking about each week. And here, it people will talk about it. But it's it's not going to get its due. That's definitely not going to get its due. And I think that stinks. Because AJ McKee against Patricky Pitbull, Bellator Lightweight Grand Prix quarterfinal. This is the final one uh, before they start the semis. I like that fight. There's a good storyline there with McKee and the Pitbull brothers. Um I, I, I'm very invested in these uh, Grand Prix. I think a lot of people get invested in the Grand Prix because they've, as much as they've kind of dragged out and maybe not happened in the most timely of fashions, I think we've had some intrigue throughout yeah. the process of doing these. I think it's been a, a good Bellator staple. And yeah, I don't know when people are going to be watching. That's probably going to be airing at the same time as Poirier and Gaethje who's watching that. <laughs> like, that's ah, just, 
It just feels like a mistake. I really like that Bellator is finally putting in a, a flyweight title and that they've got Kyoji Horiguchi going uh going against Makoto Shinryu for that belt. I, I think the world of Horiguchi, I think he's one of the best 125 or 135 pound fighters in the world. Still think he could potentially win a Bellator uh Bantamweight title if you ever got a rematch against uh, Sergio Pettis. Well, that's, I'm, I was about to say that. I was going to say, do you think Pettis can be a two-division champ if he gets past uh, Patchy? I don't think he wants to Doesn't fight want it. To do that? Yeah, I think uh-huh. he's gotten too big. All right. Um, I, I think he seems pretty comfortable when at I'm, 135. When, when I met him, he didn't seem too big a guy. Well, he's not a tall person, he's, but he's also he's he's a little more... He's a little stockier than like even his brother was, and his brother had trouble getting down in weight too. Don't forget. Now, granted, I think I mean, he probably think... would have had a better time getting to forty five like early in his career when they were first trying to get him and Jose Aldo to go against yeah. each other. That fight unfortunately never happened. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, these are two really interesting fights to me, and the way they're doing it. And, and I'm going to shout out uh, Caposa on this one because he, I mean, it was like an ask and you shall receive kind of thing where you and I were sitting around talking about. Hey, what rules are they using? What what, what are they using to fight in? Like, what, what's going on Clearly with the Bellator brother. and Ryzen? Big hmm? brother at work there. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think Capos has definitely got us mic'd. Yeah. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it was like asking you shall receive. He shares an image that I can only assume was was from uh, Ryzen here. That goes over the entire bout order and the way they do the intermissions and even explaining that, hey... After they do the first five fights being the kind of the Bellator portion in a cage during the first intermission, they will switch from the cage to the ring for all the other fights that are, I guess, technically under rise and rules here. Technically post limbs. Uh, if you want to call them post limbs, fine. But like, that's not really what it is. It's almost like after the main event of McKee and Patricky. I think you kind of just get two cards. It's like two fight cards. But that's what it's I'm almost saying. like they're almost doing it. They're calling it a Bellator X rise and two. But it's really more of a, it's almost like they're just doing one card that's Bellator and then another card that's Ryzen. But in some cases, they're using fighters from one organization or another. Well, all I'm asking is McKee is going on before Ryzen starts. <laughs> yes, he is. Okay. All right. There's your answer. But but yeah, so so the Bellator fights, those first five, those ones actually will be utilizing the unified rules. That's what this graphic also says. So, um, And then they will use the Ryzen MMA rules for the subsequent Ryzen fights. I wonder if they have different officials for each event. I can only assume that they do, but maybe I'm wrong. Hmm. I've been wrong before. Um, but yeah, I mean, on the on the Bellator side, there's there's Danny Sabatello against Magomed Magomedov. Uh, say that a billion times. <laughs> Magomed 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 Mm. So yeah. it would be it's a trend that I'm interested to see if continues. Anytime Lorenz Larkin is fighting, you have to pay attention. He's going yeah. against Andre Korshkov. I like that fight. Yeah. And then on the the rise in portion, there's a lot of good fights here. Tofik Mosayev is fighting uh, on the card too. He's fighting against Akira, who I'm not as familiar with. Uh, to be honest, I don't follow Ryzen as much as I maybe should. But I do know Saika Izawa, who is the Ryzen Super Atom Weight champion, which is technically 108 pounds. But she is considered to be the top atom weight in the world. And she's going against Claire Lopez defending her belt. We also have Kaya Sakura going against Juan Archula. Do I have that right, actually? No, it's actually, it's not Kaya Sakura. Excuse me. It is because this was an old thing I was looking off of. The graphic that was shared, it's actually Archuleta against Hiramasa Ojikubo, who you remember from The Ultimate Fighter? He was on that. Um, they were all trying to compete to fight. Uh, Tim Elliott was the one who won that one. He fought against Demetrius Johnson for that, the championship fight. That might be one of the seasons. I think Ojakubo was on that one. I'm, I'm almost positive he was from that one, which, which was also have been the same year that our new flyweight champion, Alexander Pantoja, came out. But anyway, Ojakubo is fighting against Juan Archuleta for the Rise and Bantamweight title. All right. Mm-hmm. I like these fights. I, I think it's a great card, and I think it's a terrible terrible misjudgment to have put this on the same night as a ufc pay-per-view oh my goodness so we're <sighs> gonna we're gonna cherry pick oh and next week yeah i think probably we'd only look at the bellator card anyway <laughs> for as far as for for contested rounds only look at the bellator card for contested rounds oh, I... no 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 I'm, I'm talking about in addition to the ufc oh yeah. we wouldn't oh, yeah, yeah. we're not gonna I'm go making... we're not gonna take the time and do the the rise in rules and everything like that we're we're kind of more of a unified rules of mma show it's just easier to to stick with that i think one day maybe we can figure out 
times to cherry pick, like you said, but it won't be the same night as the UFC. That's, no, that's what I meant. I meant we're only going to look at we're only going to cherry pick from Bellator while we're. Well, we might be able to just absorb those five fights. How many how many contested rounds could there be? Right? Oh right? Jesus! Come right? on, Scott. Why you do that? <laughs> All right, well, we'll be back with Monday with 150 rounds. Thanks to Scott. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, tune in for that five-hour show. It's going to be a good one, though. Promise. Thanks for listening. Take care, everyone.